Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Okay, so let's dive into the topic for today. And the topic for today is grief and loss. So... I'm going to go ahead and put this into context. We're going to talk about grief and loss from the perspective of a family member, maybe has just passed away, or maybe somebody in the family is terminally ill and the child is trying to cope with their feelings about the loss um, and the grief and they come to us for um, for support. So this episode is about how do we support the child in a grief loss experience and then also how do we support the family. So I'm going to begin this with a story. Now I believe I might have shared this story in an earlier episode but it's worth repeating even if I did. So a couple years ago I was contacted by a preschool because there was a teacher in the preschool that had suddenly passed away. And the director of the preschool wanted to meet with me and see if I'd be able to support the teachers and the students in being able to cope and integrate with what had just happened. And um, and when I began my conversation with the director, my, my question for the director was, what type of support are you looking for? What, what would you love for your staff and for the students? And what she said, uh, which is something that I think would be a really common response, she said, well, I really want to support them when they're having a hard time and they're feeling sad and being able to help them communicate to the, to the children that it's okay, that they're having a hard time and that they're feeling sad. And what I said to her was, okay, so that is, uh, that's beautiful. I could, I validated her intention and her heart and, and what she was wanting for her staff and her students. And then I said to her, I asked the question, what if they're not sad? And, and she kind of looked at me and, and I followed it up with something to the effect of, what if there's a different emotion that's present and uh, and I my in my elaboration I said let's let's think of this from the perspective of the children, you know we're making an assumption that grief and loss is sad, but um, but what if when a loss happens, what if it's not sad for someone? What if they feel relieved? What if there's a part of them that didn't like this individual and genuinely feels relieved? What if they um, have a different orientation and they feel really angry about the situation? What if they are stuck in a shock and they're not even letting themselves feel quite yet? What if someone's even happy about it, even like more than relief? And she really looked at me and we had this beautiful discussion about how sometimes culturally, and I'm speaking of the Western culture, sometimes when loss happens, we assume that the primary experience of loss is sad. But the reality is, is that when there's a loss or there's an impending loss, it can produce a whole range of experiences. And it's important that we create space for the full spectrum of the experience. And so when we are talking to children or talking to parents, it's important that we find a way to allow and to create opportunities for the full range to come in. And sometimes that's really even normalizing it for the child. So we may find ourselves saying to a child at some point, you know, it's normal 
It's normal to feel a lot of emotions. It's normal to have a part that's sad, maybe even a part that's scared, maybe even a part that is um, overwhelmed, maybe a part that's relieved. And it's important that we name and that we give the opportunity for all parts of the experience within the child to be present. Um, sometimes because of our cultural conditioning or because of a belief system that the child has that maybe sounds like, oh, I should, I should be sad that grandma is dying, then they find themselves in a bind if they feel like there's an expectation to feel a certain way, but maybe that's not what they're feeling at all. Sometimes kids feel this pressure, like if they go to a funeral or to a service of some kind, that they're supposed to be crying. And, um, and what if, again, what if they don't have that experience inside? And can we normalize that? Now, I'm going to extend this to say that oftentimes in a family system, when there is a big loss that's impacted the parents, that sometimes children will put their own emotions on hold until they perceive that the parents are able to uh, be okay or to be able to be grounded within themselves. So you've heard me talk a lot in this um, podcast series about becoming the external regulator. Some children will wait until they perceive that there's an external regulator um, in the system and then they'll allow themselves to go into the grief process. Sometimes, for example, let's say a parent passed away, the child will step, try to step into the parent's role and become partners with the other parent energetically and, um, and try to caretake the other, the other parent through the time of the grief and the loss. And so, so many different patterns and dynamics can come into play and, and just recognizing that sometimes the child will delay their experience until they perceive that the system is in order or steady enough to be able to handle their experience. Now that's not all children. Some children go right into their experience, but I think that's important for us to consider, particularly if we're working with the system, because sometimes we may need to do extra work with the parents to support them so that then they can turn around and support their, um, support the child. The other thing is that um, loss triggers loss. And I'm saying that not just for the family system, but for us as clinicians as well. When we experience a loss in life, it tends to trigger all the other losses that we haven't fully integrated yet either. And so one loss can feel like a massive loss, almost like a, a compounded loss of losses, if that makes sense. And when we are in the room with a client and loss is present, oftentimes the parts within us that feel sensitive or feel unresolved around our own losses in our life can get, can get touched on. And so it's important that we recognize how we respond to loss because how we respond to loss will impact how we facilitate the loss with the child. So sometimes, let's just say, if, a, if the pattern in the therapist world was to numb out around loss or to become the helper or to want to fix or become the savior in some way or to want to distract and um, pretend like it's not happening or to get really heady and get really organized and detailed and all of that to try to just make sense of the loss, so really left brain rather than feeling into it. I'm just putting this out here as you consider this in your own work that oftentimes how we experience loss and our own coping strategies around loss will then be what shows up in the playroom when the child is bringing up loss also in the playroom. And their loss can then impact and trigger the loss in us. And so I find um, in my own journey, and then also just as a supervisor observing this in, in so many different supervisees, that it's important that when loss shows itself, that we pause and we check in with ourselves. It's a place for a bit more tenderness, a place for a bit more inquiry, um, a place, it's almost like an invitation or a window has been opened that allows us to just check in 
check in in our own lives, check in in our own loss history, and can we still stay connected to ourselves while we're facilitating this process for the, for the client. I'm going to say something else here about loss um, that may be interesting for many of you to hear. And if you're curious, I'm going to invite you to go do your own research on this. But there's quite a bit of research in the field. Even Time Magazine many years ago came out with a beautiful article talking about this. Um, and what they were discussing was the grieving brain and what actually happens inside the grieving brain. And what's super fascinating is that the grieving brain is very similar to the brain of someone who's in an addictive process going through withdrawal. I'm going to say that again. The grieving brain is very similar to the brain of an individual that is going through the withdrawal effects of some type of an addictive process. Now, when we look at this more deeply to understand grief, um, we can look at this from a couple different places. One is that when somebody passes away, we typically miss or grieve the things that we considered positive about the individual. Um, we tend to miss the smile or the feeling of holding their hand or you know the way that they cooked or whatever that may be. We don't tend to miss um, the way that they talk to us in a negative tone. Um, we don't miss their, you know, their, uh, their dirty clothes and farts and, you know, whatever. Um, we don't miss, uh, the, um, the times that, that in our perception, they were being mean to us in some way. So it's interesting to think about that the grief process is very much connected with the positive associations that we have with someone in the brain. And what the grieving brain, chemically, what it does is that it's withdrawing from the dopamine that we had from those particular parts that we were um, in relationship with, that we felt were we were really, we could say, connected to. We might even say we were addicted to in our own way. We might say that, um, that we might have even been infatuated with in some way. And, and by the way, as I'm saying this, there's no judgment in what I'm saying. This isn't good, bad, right, wrong. This is simply what happens in the, in the brain. And so the grief symptoms, um, what they are showing in the brain and the physiology are that. It's the withdrawal symptoms from the dopamine. They've also shown that people are able to move through grief faster when they aren't um, looking at pictures over and over again, listening to songs over and over again, because what they're actually doing is keeping the dopamine in the system going. Now, that's not to say that if there is a loss that you don't um, remember or think about or anything like that. Again, I'm just giving you a framework to understand this. So one of the ways that we can work with our child clients is to, I already said this first one, to allow the full range of feelings. Now, let me, let me tie in what I just said about the grieving brain with the full range of feelings. If somebody has just passed away in the family and the person who, um, the client, for example, or one of the children in the system didn't feel they had a positive relationship with that individual or didn't feel um, overly connected in a positive way or wasn't admiring certain parts or wasn't infatuated or overly connected, you may not get the typical grief symptoms because they don't have the dopamine associations in the brain. Um, in fact, they might actually have a more neutral response in the system. So we may not see the dysregulation um, activated in the system like we would with somebody that was really connected to the, to the individual that just passed. So as we're facilitating the process with the client, I want you to know that in many ways, you're facilitating the withdrawal process from the client's associations to whomever it is that has just passed or is sick and is dying. Um, we also find, you may even uh, correlate this, if this has been an experience in your life, that if somebody 
let's say has been sick for quite a while, that over time, the withdrawal symptoms actually almost start to integrate on their own because the, the let's say if someone's been really sick and the family's had to take care of somebody, um, the family can actually arrive at a place where there's relief if the individual passes because they have um, the positive experiences don't feel so positive anymore. Right, it's it's harder to want to stay connected if you know the time caretaking has felt a bit draining, um, and so you can actually find that when someone passes, that there's a real sense of relief, and that not that there isn't the the grief or the loss or those other emotions, but maybe not as strongly as if someone just passed away suddenly. Now, let me just say that everything I'm saying are total general generalizations, and there are variations on this across the board. This also has a cultural influence. There are cultures in the world where um, sadness is not the go-to and the grief process is not the go-to process. There are many cultures in the world where when someone passes, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of joy. Um, there are cultures where if you, if you were sort of the opposite, if you were to show signs of sadness, if you were to even speak the person's name, that that would actually be considered rude. Um, so we also want to keep cultural context in, in mind as well when we're working with the child. So not only is the child going through a grief process, but what are the influences that have contributed to this child's grief process? Um, what are the different associations that they have towards the person? What are the cultural influences that have supported or not supported uh, responding in a particular way? How can that be affecting the brain and the physiology? So um, I'm going to say two more things and then I'm going to get into like a couple of different ideas about actually what to do in the playroom. The other idea, one of the other two ideas that I want to talk about is that uh, many times, or not even many times, what you're really working with when you're working with the grief and the loss um, with a child is really helping them navigate the unknown. When someone passes away, the feeling of unknown can get stirred up in such a profound way. The, um, you know, what's going to happen next? Who am I going to live with? Who's going to take care of me? Um, uh, where did daddy go? Let's say daddy passed away. Where did daddy go? Um, is daddy in heaven? It can produce so many different questions. Um, you know, where, when someone dies, what happens to their body? Um, what's going to happen to our family? Um, is mom going to be okay? So many different, so many different questions. Are we going to be okay financially? So sometimes fears can come up that we need to address in the playroom with the child. Um, sometimes just teaching the child and working with the child on helping them be comfortable in the unknown, the anxieties that can come up is part of the work that we have to do. When a child asks you questions like, where did my daddy go? Um, it's really important that you bring in uh, first of all, permission from the family to talk about possible different uh, uh, belief systems about where the child went. It's really important that you help the child orient into where do the, what are they thinking. So if a child says, you know, my daddy died, um, Lisa, do you think that my daddy went to heaven? Well, it's not up for me to, in those moments, to talk about heaven or not or share my belief. The question really is, um, what do you think? Where do you think daddy went? Do you think that daddy went to heaven? What is, what is heaven? And help the child orient and make meaning out of their own unknowns is so much more important than you sharing your own belief system. Now, if you're in a place where you feel like it's important to share different belief systems, I encourage you to share many. So some people believe this, and some people believe this, and some people believe this, and, and then back to the child, what makes the most sense to you? Sometimes children are told something that in their mind doesn't make any sense. So I had a child once whose um, grandmother passed away, and the family told the child that um, 
the that their um, grandparent was up in the stars and that they were looking down and talking to him from the stars. Well, something about this just didn't land for the child and the child was really confused. And this actually came out in play therapy about, I don't, I don't believe stars can talk and I don't understand how my grandparent could be in a star. And that just prompted questions about um, what did that child believe? And it's okay to believe something different than maybe what your brother believes or what your family members believe. Everybody has a different belief about what happens. And again, I hope you are hearing, it's really important to help the child begin to understand and get curious about what they believe. How do they orient uh, to their own internal system? So those were the two pieces is the, a lot of our work is uh, working with the unknown. Um, and then also, you know, how do we answer some of those questions? So let me just give a little bit of an overview here because I've tried to talk about a big concept in a really short period of time. So um, hopefully this conversation isn't feeling all over the place and I'm just giving you some like just bullet point things to go with. So we talked about how it's important to create space for all of the different emotions that can come up. That sometimes children will take on multiple roles in the family system and some children will wait until they perceive that the system is grounded in order for them to be able to go into their process. That loss can actually just trigger other losses, and not only within the child and the family system, but also within us as the therapist and how important it is for us to be able to really look at how do we handle loss and how historically have we handled loss because there's a probability that how we've handled it and how we've managed it might show up in the playroom um, as a coping strategy when we begin to feel the loss also with the child, which I didn't say this explicitly, but what it may end up doing is preventing us from being able to go into the loss and just be with the child in the loss without trying to make it better or trying to fix it or make the, the hard feelings go away. I talked a bit about the grieving brain and encourage you to go do some research on that if that's of interest to you. And, and just really to understand that when we see the grief symptoms, that in the brain there is a withdrawal that's happening from the dopamine that was happening in the associations with this individual when we were feeling connected to them or um, had a had a positive orientation to the relationship or certain things that the that the individual um, did or are offered to us. And I mentioned that's not good, bad, right, or wrong. It's just, a, I think, a really lovely way actually to understand and normalize the grief, um, the grief symptoms that the child is experiencing. And then the child may not have many grief symptoms, and that doesn't mean that they're in denial. It could be, but it also could be that, um, that they genuinely... Um, are not grieving in the way that we would expect them to grieve in our culture, which is also then I talked about the importance of looking at different cultures at large and what are the influences and belief systems that this child might be immersed in um, and could that in any way be contributing to how they grieve, how they don't grieve, do they need to grieve, what's appropriate, what isn't appropriate. So I mentioned I'm covering a lot of topics in a short period of time because this really is a this really could be a whole day workshop where we could go into each one of them individually. But I wanted to give you just some some different different points to consider. And then we talked about working with the unknown, and then if the child's asking specific questions, how to navigate um, some of those. So as far as in the playroom, sand trays, amazing. Um, even just allowing the child to just play and you joining them in the play, allowing their own process to unfold through the grief and the loss. Um, recognize that the felt sense will be the felt sense of whatever aspect of that, whether it is frustration or sadness or fear or anxiety or whatever may come up. If you are noticing that there are huge fears, that may be something to uh, go directive about and address with the family. So maybe this child does need more conversation about what's happening next. Um, maybe this child does need some more support around understanding more the concrete facts about either what happened, what will happen, those kinds of things. 
um, you can work through grief and loss through art, um, through puppets, um, really any medium that you can think of in a, in a creative process can be so supportive for a child um, through this. My encouragement to you is to um, allow them to choose, allow them to be, um, and that our work is to do our own internal work to be able to sit beside them in the unknown as they sort through the, um, the myriad of internal experiences and emotions um, as they process uh, either the loss that has happened or the impending loss that is to come. Thank you everyone for joining me on this episode. I look forward to our next uh, time together. And as always, uh, take care of yourselves. You are the most important toy in the playroom. Until next time.